Boom. We are here. There you go. YouTube, we're up, baby. Welcome to another live podcast. Timbo? Can you see it? Yeah. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I can't see YouTube. Don't worry. So I'll just, I'll, I'll fly you blind. You fly blind. It's just, there'll, there'll be a delay on the stream. Okay. It's all good. Are you going to I will monitor, I Mr. will monitor the, um, the, the, the comments. Yes. Yeah. So Joe Whelan is watching. Hi, Joe. On, uh, he sent a message. So we are, we are good and we are live. Woody DMB is in. Right. So we right. are, if you have any questions, start putting those into the comments. We are kicking this off with the, uh, and the, the, your questions can be related to anything that you've got to do with your training, but we are kicking things off with um, just a, a bit of a spitball session on the art of coaching. We, I guess, um, at the scorecast and it's pride ourselves on coaching and being able to help you through the best coaching we can provide. Um, and we get a lot of questions about coaching and how to become coaches and all that sort of thing. And, uh, something that Tim, um, taught me very early on in my S and C career, when I was learning from him back in the cracking, we're going back now, 2014. Um, yeah, you talked about the, right. like the, the art of it. Um, the, the, the art versus the science of coaching. I thought that was a nice, cause it's something that people don't generally talk about. It's like, oh, you need to do this many reps, this many that, you know, um, and we, we, we can get lost in the detail and miss out on the sort of more of the, I guess the human interactions as part of that. But, but what else goes into the art of coaching? A bit of advice for anyone that is interested in, you know, trying to improve themselves as a coach or become a coach. Good question. I think, I mean, it's, yeah, they're always trying to, to balance that art and science of of the delivery because ultimately in training and strength and conditioning and calisthenics and whatever kind of format we look at, we're talking about a, a sport science, a training science, the principles that underpin it and go, well, ultimately what we're trying to do is create adaptation. So there's, got, there's certain things that research has told us and what we know from practice that is going to work. And we need to know if we want this type of adaptation, mm. we need to apply that kind of stress. And how we do that, how we structure it, and how we fit it all together is can be quite scientific. And you could read a textbook about periodization. That's probably a great example of it, of going, how do we periodize a four-year cycle? Or, or how do we peak for, I don't know, 20 games of rugby in a season or, or whatever it might be? But the issue comes if you just try and roll that plan and you don't have any artistry with it, then it just be, it won't work as, as effectively because you you always have got to coach the athlete that's in front of you. So from a, from a training perspective, I've, athletes that I've worked with over time, you know where they are and what the session is going to look like the moment they walk in the door because you can just see their body language, you can see how they carry themselves, you can, you know, the first kind of minute of a conversation, you're like, right, okay, this session that I've got planned is going to go ahead or this session needs to be adapted because the athlete's not in the place where I thought they were going to be, so we need to change it. So that's kind of like just from a session perspective, but then even in, a, in, a, in an exercise rep range, or if you kind of go, right, well, it's a peak set for today, this is our target exercise, um, and they're kind of repping away, and you've got a certain amount of load planned for that session, or you, you think you might be able to squeeze out an extra set, or you need to do a set less, or whatever it might be. Those are all mm -hmm. adjustments that you need to make, and the only way that you can make those is from experience, of actually seeing people doing it and, and testing it. And, you can learn science, right? I mean, you can get, you could have two PhDs and be a horrible coach. You might have more knowledge than anybody else, but if you can't deliver it in a way which is one, the athlete's going to buy into or people are going to buy into. And secondly, is actually going to be able to shape, evolve, mold, change around what each individual session looks like, then you're going to have a fairly limited impact. And I, and I think that's like, we need to become our own little coaches. Like, I adapt my sessions all the time based on how I feel mm. or what I feel like I'm going to do next week. So an example would be this morning. I have Thursdays are quite a tough session. It's like the back end of the week. I've done, it's my fourth session of the week so far. I've got some tough exercises in it. But you're sort of like, so do I go all in on that today? Or am I going to, is next week a deload week? So I know I can reach a little bit. I'm going to push a bit more today because next week I'm going to get my deload mm. or whatever it might be. So I just, it's always that constant balance between principles and, and theory and then actually the delivery and just yeah, being that artist which can move these pieces around to make something a little bit more. Yeah, there's there's something special. I wanted to touch on that you'll uh, you'll probably you'll you'll laugh at me um, in relation to this because almost and it just if you if you sort of cast your mind back to remember when you were um, and I want to look I want to just this is the point I'm going to make is related to like be it when you're like a new coach but as well as 
if even just your own training, you know, you know, you gave that example there of you adapting your own. Um, and I think that we can sometimes get paralyzed by the plan, particularly, and this is a little bit of self-awareness, particularly if you are the type of person that's like, right, if I've written this down, then that's what I'm going to do. And if that's the plan, I must do the plan. And that can creep, that, that personality trait will tr creep into your own training, but it will creep into you as a coach. And I think the other thing is, when you're new to coaching, so anyone that's like in the early years of becoming like a personal trainer or coaching, it might, might be a coach in something else. It doesn't have to be in, in personal training or in, in calisthenics and that type of stuff. But um, when you're new to something, I used to find that I would like be paralyzed by the plan, but more a case of like almost hiding behind the plan. It's like, here's what I've, I've had loads of time to think about this and I've planned this out and I think this is what I should be doing. And then when you've got to adapt and, and roll with it on your feet and think on your feet, like in the gym environment, then that's actually really cutting your teeth and challenging you as, as the coach. And you've got to make a decision on the spot from what you've seen or what you've observed or what you've heard. And I think that's the, when you're talking about the art coach, that was something that I learned from you um, very much so in the early days. And I used to find it quite, um, my, my, my personality in terms of like planning and doing all that, it would be very much, I'd like, I'd want to do a very nice plan and I'd want to be able to like do the plan. <laughs> it was like, I can't change the plan because this is what we wrote down. And then with my own training, that's something that um, I've got, I probably got way better at doing that as a coach than I did for my own training. Um, and, and there's only really starting to sort of benefit from that more, that approach of just because that isn't what we planned uh, and isn't what I've planned for myself, I don't have to roll it out. We, we used to have it. Uh, there was a number of us were, were very similar when I was playing rugby where the coach would put the session up on the board in the gym, the SNC coach. And there'd be times where he'd like, you'd get so far down and then he'd like, you know, he'd cross off a set or he'd just see how you're performing. And we would like test our vertical jump to, to, to check our sort of neural um, fatigue and that sort of stuff like during throughout the session. And he would, he would change that session sometimes as we were going, as you know, as you're describing as a good coach should. But us as players, we were like, whoa, 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 no, no, I'm not, I'm not doing one less. You originally, there was a five there, so I'm doing five sets. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 <laughs> like three is enough today because I'm because of what I'm seeing. And he would have to miss this, 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 this like bargaining of like trying to convince him that we should be allowed to do more. When if you asked yourself deep down, you knew that you were fatigued, but you was just like you didn't want to show it. Um, so I just I, I find it fascinating from both sides of it as a as a coach and then as a as the person trying to train or the athlete. I think it's like people get into the routine of stuff and, and that's the hard bit when you haven't got a coach is somebody is there to tell you that you are not going to do that. And if you've got a good working relationship with a the coach, then you respect their decision and you actually go, well, most of the times I'm paying <laughs> yes. you to do that for me so that I don't have to think about it. That's your job. Um, whereas oftentimes like I'm, I'm in this, this, this thing now, right, where I've found this little routine that work is working for me. And I'm now like, well, I train five days a week. Yeah. That's what I do. So, but I really enjoy that time. It's the first bit of when I wake up in the morning, it's the only real time that I get to myself during the whole day. So I'm kind of like now clinging to it because it's good for my head as well as from a physical perspective. But you can get into that thing of like, I, know, I don't want to miss mm. workouts now. and I don't really want to scale them, but I'm not, I'm pretty good to be fair at going. Like last week, I didn't want to deload because we've got a baby imminent any point You know now. deload is coming. <laughs> so I know my my deload is coming. So I'm now strategically <laughs> overreaching, knowing that I'm probably do a deload week. But I, why deload now if I'm going to have to deload when the baby comes in the next couple of weeks? So I might as well just train through providing that i haven't got any injuries i'm not feeling particularly niggly yeah. i feel fine to be honest give us an insight tim um, what's you of the oh, do you, go on, new, finish, i was just gonna say i think people be interested what's the new uh, routine that you've 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 uh, feeling comfortable in uh yeah I'll, I'll, so in terms of the session what i was going to say is i think if you say mm. you do crossfit you train six days a week all of a sudden not training six days a week is like a bit of a mind bender like i well, I train six. I've got to go. I've got to Twice go. That's a day. I do. Tra yeah, training the body doesn't work like that. Like you can't just pile more and more stress on top of it, and that's where the power of having a coach or at least getting a structured program is really beneficial. Where he's got scheduled deloads. If someone gives you a plan, and you go, "Here's four weeks of training," and then for every fifth week is going to be a deload week. All of a sudden, you don't feel so mm -hmm. bad about having a deload week because it's structured. 
Whereas if you go, well, just rest when you in this cycle. So I think for, for most people, there's probably a bit of a halfway house for, for the most kind of like the recreational trainer, if you like, or athlete, if you've got to become your own coach. But the, the, the most important thing that you've got to develop is you need a plan and some structure, but you also need to be the artist yourself and, and understand that you're playing a bigger game. It's never about one session, ever. The one session is important, but how many sessions can you stick together over a consistent period of time? That is what's going to make the massive difference. And what was always from a, from a sports performance perspective, and we can apply these principles to ourselves, is just that we don't have a competition to peak for. If you push too hard and you get injured and you now can't train at full capacity for three weeks because you blow your shoulder out mm. or back out or, or knee out or whatever it might be, well, you're now going to go backwards way more than you would have been if you kind of just allowed yourself to tweak your program on a, one, on a daily basis. So sometimes if I might have a set down. I'm going to go, I'm going to go on exercise. I'm doing five sets today. The other last week or the week before, it might have been, that you know what, I did my fifth set and I felt great. So I was like, I'm going to take another mm. one. I'm going to take that now while I feel good. Whereas another session, I might be like, you know what, that last set was a struggle. Rather than like limping through another eight reps, half arsing it with dodgy technique, just just do four. Like it's there's nothing magic is going to happen in any one session. It's just a, a little bit mm. of stress, get the adaptation, but you're far better off being a little bit more kind of uh, like like less strict with you with your programming and less kind of like dogmatic about it and just being let's just flow through this a little bit and make the adjustments as we go stay in the game as long as you're doing quality work you'll get where you yeah. want to be I've just before there is a question about um and i was intrigued of what this what your sort of new routine is i can think people like to hear that i was just to reiterate or just a uh, an example from sport of of that type of thing um those the any any sort of rugby fans out there um, in the UK will remember uh, Jordan Murphy, and he played at Leicester Tigers for forever, and was ba basically never injured. Um, and one of the one of the guys, some of the guys we played with, um, had played with him at Leicester, and they they were saying that his his approach, like in the gym, he would always save one or two reps in the bag. He never maxed out ever, and. What did that actually mean for him? Well, he never overreached. He was never, he was never injured, and he played a lot of rugby. And because he played a lot of rugby, he was very consistent and and, and was very good. And uh, that really challenged that always like that always challenged me. I was like, hmm, really? Like, how does how does that work? Um, you know, I was of a mindset. Well, Jordan Murphy was actually head of the science because it's now come out you can find the research that says if you're looking for maximal strength games you don't need to lift maximally you can do less repetitions and still get comparable strength gains without going to failure yeah. for, for, for maximal strength adaptation training so he was only not only was he not not rinsed himself all the time neurally he was actually probably getting as strong as other people because at that point we all thought we had to go to failure if we wanted to get anywhere near creating adaptations yeah so, yeah um, so, uh, uh, 369 Gurav Shamar live on the YouTube has asked, how many hours do you train daily? And the, which obviously ties into that. I was, uh, I was going to get you to just, what is that? What is that morning routine saying like training five times a week? What does that, what does that look like? Give us a bit of a, an overview. I think people are interested. Uh, yeah. So the history of that is that I've really struggled to put together a consistent training block for a couple of years, probably it's been pretty sporadic particularly this year within lockdown and having been sort of, I, I don't have a gym access anymore. No one has gym access anymore. Like it's, they've got taken <laughs> away from us, but even in normal times, I don't have a gym access anymore. So my environment to training is at home. And what I was finding was really difficult was to switch from a work mode mm -hmm. into a training mode in the middle of the day. I was at my desk. I'm kind of in that mindset to break away from that, but be in the same space and train was really difficult. We also are having less free time during the day because my little boy was leaving the house later and coming home earlier. So I only had a short period of time really to get the work done and to take an hour or so out of that to train was just, I couldn't fit everything in. Um, so what I decided to do was just get up earlier and like, I, I'm not, I'm not one for like hustle porn in terms of, hustle porn. oh yeah, go to bed later, get up earlier. Like I, I don't want to glamorize that, but I'm generally a morning person. I, I don't, I, I wouldn't be good training at eight, nine o'clock at night, but I can train at five o'clock in the morning. So I set my alarm at half past five 
I get out of bed, I come downstairs, I have a coffee, um, I stop my session about I probably take 15 minutes of prep, just kind of getting into the session. I, I aim for sort of probably 40 minutes. It could be as little as 30 minutes, but it's maximum. My cutoff is seven o'clock. Um, and I'll just do that five days a week. And it's mostly total body. So I'll, I'll focus on workouts around three main exercises. I'll have a push, pull and a lower body. Um, and that'll be either vertical push and pull or, or push or pull, horizontal push or pull. And then some kind of like either hip or knee sort of movement base. So that could be something like today was shrimp squats and Nordics. And then I had um, ring dips and a tuck row on the rings, tuck horizontal row. Um, and that'll be the session. So I'm not doing a huge amount of density, but my sets are quite high. So I'm probably targeting five, six sets on, on some of that stuff on a, on a kind of a higher volume week. Um, but my little boy was allowed out of his bedroom at seven o'clock. So at that point I am there to i don't want to be like yeah th those I, little everyone's got a little boy in pajamas <laughs> like it's pretty cool like they're just cute like so i like spending time with the first time and first thing in the morning when he wakes up so i go back upstairs and we read stories and, and whatever else but yeah it's it's a nice time in the morning where i just get to be by myself and the house is quiet and nobody else is awake and, I, and i'm now in week five this will be the end of week five so i'll have done 25 strength sessions in the last five weeks nice and I reckon that's probably more than what I did in six months prior to that. <laughs> I'm look, I'm looking forward to Possibly. when uh, Jack is like, I don't know, you know, when you get to about fourteen, fifteen, you're like, you're dead skinny, and you're like, oh, I need to, I need to, I need to do some, I need to do some training, and he's going to be like, right, Dad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come train with you in the mornings, like that'd be, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be cool, that'd be cool. So yeah, it's working. I mean, and I, I don't want to be like I, I wouldn't necessarily say that work that needs to be like that's the secret. Yeah. That's just what's works for me. And I think you've just got to try and find something which which fits and um i was like i woke up early last night or this morning i couldn't sleep that well so i woke up and i was lying in bed just thinking about getting on the train i nearly got up earlier to just come and get started but it's when you find something that works and you get the benefit from it you kind of want to do it mm. and training's not an issue anymore it's that's that's it's really solved it for me so it's been very uh very good so five hours a week and then i might try and fit a run or two in if i can but those are kind of a bit more flexible nice joe whelan uh, live on YouTube has asked uh, a good question about uh, what materials or like books or documents or anything like what things would you recommend on coaching? What do you think, Jack? Are you super training say, for the average reader? <laughs> super training <laughs> is super difficult to read. I do have a copy of super training. I haven't read it front to back. Um, it is it's yeah, dry, it isn't is, it? Uh, it is challenging. Um, you know, it's, you know what? Some of the things for me had been um, like the the corrective exercise book and performance enhancement specialist by NSAM, which is the textbooks that you do as part of those courses. Like, they're probably they're the they're the two things that I go back to now more than anything when I'm looking at a, looking at some some text or text will remind myself about some things. It's th th there's so much depth there. When I go back now and look at it. I'm like, crikey, I didn't know anything when I like, I don't know, I got like 94% on the exam or whatever. But when I think back to what it was like when I did it, I'm like, I didn't, I didn't know anything really. It makes more sense now. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, that's an interesting question because I, I think about the different sorts of training books that I've mm. read over the years. And like the National Academy of Sports Medicine books and, and super training and the essentials of strength and conditioning and, and those kind of like industry textbooks are designed for professionals really so if you're a recreational training you want a little bit of knowledge um you're probably going to get dive into that and all of a sudden you're, you're learning about sliding filament theory and and like stuff that you probably don't necessarily need to detail of and to pull the the real kind of gems out of it you you you, you need to kind mm. of understand the whole thing of how it fits together so I, I would probably go and look for people who are in the type of training that you enjoy and find books which are written from a slightly more layman's perspective. And that doesn't, I don't mean that at all disrespectfully, but like Kelly Starrett's How to Be a Supple Leopard, that was a really nice book in terms of just understanding his philosophy around training. The part, first half mm. of it is like, this is what I, this is what I think, this is what's important. The second half of it was exercises, but you could read that without a huge amount of training knowledge and take something away from it. The only difference with that is, and there'll be, there'll be people like kettlebells, somebody, someone have done that for kettlebells, somebody who's done it for, for bodyweight training, will do it for bodyweight training at some point. Um, there'll be, there'll be lots of different people, these books out. The only 
issue with that is you're understanding methods, not necessarily always principles. So you that that's, that'll be there. I see the systematic approach in. Whereas if you understand from a science science perspective, you'll understand the principles, and then you can go, well, how does like Pavel's kettlebell stuff fit into this? How does the West Side barbell stuff mm. fit into this? And and then you understand how these things fit together. So it depends on the, the level of the deep dive that you want to go on. Um, but I would, yeah, search out good people. I mean, someone like Ross Edgley has got done this world's fittest book. I think something like that is designed for people to use without being overly scientific. And it would give you a good broad base of understanding yeah. around. Yeah, but I've read Ross's subjects. book that has, it's good in that it's like, it's brought like, cause he's literally like, it does everything. It covers a little bit of everything. So that is good. You reminded me when you say Kelly Strat of, of um, freestyle connection from uh, Carl Perley. That's a great, that's a great book that does, does like, has the specifics of like movements and obviously there's the CrossFit element, but it's very much about movement and it's very much about principles. And it's a, it's a really, it's a nice looking book. You know, it's, it, it's easy to read and that is, yeah, I would, uh, I would, I would recommend that one. I did actually really, really enjoy that. Even though it, if, even if you're not like a massive, like fan of exactly that way of moving, like there's, there's a lot in there that is principles that you can then apply to however it is that you, you like to move yourself um i think books the way to go that's where i think we, we're in a, in a digital mm. information age where we just need to sort of like be a little bit sort of maybe a little bit more um selective about how we're going to go and learn because i think where we with, with social media and youtube for for all the good that they do like you never really get the full picture we, we you never really get that kind of complete understanding whereas in a book if you can find the uh, motivation or whatever to read it somebody is going to lay out a process so you're going to understand much more about it so if you come and see our handstand video for example on youtube you'll get a snippet of what we think about handstands and some of them are, are fairly detailed but you're not going to get everything from that one video it's just not possible to put it all together so um i, I would sort of go down that route of, of try and find a couple of sources and 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 try and work your way through some of their content and see if you can apply it into mm -hmm. something that's the that's the big thing of like understand that no textbook and no online course or training program is ever going to program for you specifically as an individual because it's not possible until somebody writes you an individual program so you've got to then start using yourself and your training as a case study or as an experiment so take some principles and methods apply them to your training give it six eight weeks and see what happens and then go and tweak it and learn more along the way um, just going sort of bespoke out of a book isn't going to get you that far like a calisthenics example of that is convict conditioning it was the first calisthenics book that i read and it's got some uh, some science at the beginning uh, loosely um and then some of the progressions are are just sort of like well you can do this do that and i'm like well that's not that's like when you can do 20 of these then you can go into the next progression and I'm like it's not that simple there is always going to be some stumbling blocks between just, it's like a muscle up. Just because you can do 20 pull-ups doesn't mean you can do a muscle up. Um, there's always going to be a little bit. And that, that goes back to the conversation about artistry of just starting to experiment, play, change, evolve, adapt, and make it individualized to yourself. Good stuff. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, that always a level of detail to uh, to the advice that you, uh, you've you come to expect from Scorecast. Center. So, Joe, we and I hope that, uh, I hope that helps you. <laughs> There's, we've got we've got a couple of people that are arguing amongst themselves in the uh, in the comments. So I won't worry too much about Excellent. that. But well rounded um, has got a couple of questions um, related to like pull ups, false gripping, and so I, will, will, I think we can we can nudge these few together. So hi gents, I'm currently working on my false grip ready for ring muscle ups. Trouble is, I find it easier uh, to put my entire wrist over the ring than the actual false grip itself. Any tips? Um, and it was also, and how often would you Project train F. false grip for beginners? Um, uh, so when you, so you can, if you put the ring or if you put the whole of your wrist over the top, if you've got enough wrist flexibility, you can do that. And to be honest, that was probably how I did my very first ever one, but then had like a horrific pain at the bottom of your wrist. And so those that are watching live on, on YouTube, as it like a horrific pain on here where the ring is rubbing. Now, you don't need to put yourself through that much pain. The ring can cover and come down onto the fat pad. So on the, on the hand side, not the wrist side of that uh, bone at the bottom. So it's going to sit through the, the, the hand at the top here and come across on the diagonal, not up into the fingers, but down on that fat pad. And then, you know, it really is just a case of 
two things like kind of thing, movement and strength. The whole of our school calisthenics framework is based on those two pillars. Um, you often don't think about it when we're talking about grip, but for a false grip, it is the movement is, can I create a decent amount of wrist flexion? So that is bringing the thumb and the hand like down towards your forearm. And then have I got strength in my grip in terms of my finger strength, but equally my forearm flexors to be able to maintain that position. Um, so it, it just comes into that. And the way we build up that, the, the, the movement quality and also in terms of range of motion and then the strength to be able to hold it is the same as anything in terms of that progressive overload. We want to start easy and we want to build it up gradually over time. We want to increase the range that we can create comfortably wrist flexion. And then we want to increase the strength gradually um, by challenging the demand of how we're false gripping. So to start with, that might be fault doing doing ring rows where your feet are on the floor, but just getting used to the ring being in that false grip, not trying to like completely hang there altogether. Um, and then you can make those more challenging by changing your foot position until eventually you start working on potentially some eccentric um, ring false grip pull-ups before you think about can I hold and just pause in that position before can I actually do some full pull-ups in that position um, and build that up nice and gently and progressively we've got a like for our online programs the muscle up we've broken into two completely different programs there is a bar muscle up program in the virtual classroom for online members and there is um, the ring muscle up program and you can buy just one program if, if you want but if you get a membership you get access to to all sorts of different stuff but um we broke them separately because the the grip between the bar and the ring muscle up is very different and the techniques that then follow with that um are all, also um different equally the stronger you are at pull-ups and the stronger you are at dips the better that's going to be for both of them um and one thing i would say for um for beginners particularly is don't try and push that too far when you're not used to false gripping it is awkward and feels horrible um, we are basically like putting the wrist on top of the ring where we want to finish up in our uh, finish our transition which is the bottom of a deep deep ring dip so when you're in a ring dip you're false gripping the ring and you'll be like no no i'm just holding it normally but you are the hand is in that position and all you do is come underneath and round and then you're going to cock the wrist to find that position when you're in and that's what the actual false grip is um appreciate if you're listening to this later and you haven't got the visuals um but you, th we've got plenty of videos explaining tutorials of how to do it but you don't that's the type of thing uh, and i would say this for anything and see what you think Tim. but generally i don't train any specific thing more than once a week like i don't do muscle ups twice a week or flags twice a week or anything i don't do anything twice a week really um I'll train twice a week or my lower body twice a week, but it's all, I'll always do different things, partly because I don't want to overload. Um, and, and massively with those false grips, that's the, that's the, like, the danger you have as a beginner. You're not used to spending that much time gripping and particularly in that wrist flexion. So the, the flexor tendons just get overworked. When you get um, like an overworking of the flexor tendons compared to the extensor tendons, which are on the outside of the forearm, then you get this in muscle imbalance and then you end up with effectively pain around the elbow which would often fits on the inside of a golfer's um elbow and you don't really want to go there because that can take a long time to slow down and as tim said right at the beginning talking about training being able to train consistently staying injury free is a massive part um, of that i agree I think my mm. other thing was just to say if, you, if you're going to go like far over the ring and you're almost not false gripping in a position you almost got it resting on your wrist it's, you can probably pull in that position, but when you get into your transition and you want to go into your dip, the ring's going to have to move on your hand because you're not really going to be able to dip with it too far down towards the wrist. So again, that that's going to present a, a certain level of uh, instability, I'd say risk at that point as well, if, you, if you're having to shift your hand. So um, yeah, go through the process, try and build into some of that hanging strength, take your time, but just it will be worthwhile because you have far more control over the ring and that transition is going to feel much more stable if you've got a really solid grip on that ring in that false grip position. But it is, it, no one likes it to start off with. Um, I've got a quick one. Uh, Kamal has asked, um, the yeah, obviously maybe <laughs> the, the, the guy on the left, his hair, and that you are you are on the left of the screen, Tim. That volume and consistency <laughs> is an effing astonishing, absolute grand slam of a hairstyle, mate. As it M eight. Now, up to you whether you want to answer this because he hasn't even he hasn't even referred to you. He's called you the guy on the left. He hasn't used <laughs> our, either of our names. He doesn't know either of our names. So he's obviously an avid listener of the podcast, and I thank you and appreciate you for your time. Um, 
Interestingly, Tim, is that paranoid now? <laughs> no, you're saying it's grand slam. I've never heard anyone call a hairstyle grand slam. And hey, I'm over to open, but someone said that looked like a paintbrush, which I think is the best compliment ever. But thank you. And um, yeah, if I, I'm going for the Scotty too hotty look, if I had a visor yes. I'd just straight out of the top, I tried to get him on the podcast, it. and uh, that didn't work out. Um, Gurav yeah. uh, Shamar, who is in, um, he is in India and says, uh, you guys, uh, kind of sense is growing in India a lot. We are a, uh, a big inspiration, very popular here. If we get any chance, please come and visit India. Uh, but he also has a question about his handstand. He is struggling to balance his legs in the handstand. Any tips about this? Tim has had his handstands. Tips on balancing your handstand. Yeah, with it, your legs, it's balancing everything, uh, really, isn't it? It's not just don't don't think about it as just one thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to work out just in terms of what you mean by by your legs. I guess are you finding it difficult to kind of keep the legs straight, um, and therefore or are you finding the legs are going over your over your head? But without knowing the detail of it, the the best the best thing that you can do is spend more time practicing against the wall. So many people struggle to. Um, struggle well they don't they struggle to stay against the wall for long enough because if they kind of get drawn into free space thinking i'm going to get this nailed down you kick up and you keep falling over if you can kick up to the wall or kick up next to the wall and not touch the wall with your feet but still maintain a handstand then you're in a good place so to get to that point where you need to try and kick up to the wall get a nice alignment if you're if you're not sure try and film it from side on so you can see what your alignment is try and get straight and then gradually just take your feet off the wall maybe one at a time and then see if you can get two off at the same time. If you if you video that and you're constantly hitting the wall and you find your feet are always going over the top, you need to kind of make a little bit of a correction down the midsection. So you want to be pushing, making sure that you're into a nice long straight position to the shoulders and not allowing your hands to come down ever so slightly into more like a chest press type position. So that's really important. That you keep the hands up nice and straight because that sets the line. And then keeping the tummy tight, like ribcage locked down on top of the hips, pointing the toes to keep that line. And what you'll find is you create that splint down the front of the body in a straight line. And that will help you to, to keep the balance rather than letting your feet kind of um, go over the head into the wall a little bit. So I'm, I'm guessing that might be the issue. Um, but if it's not, you can ask a follow-up question and give yeah, you some Yeah, there was a well-rounded that asked that question about the... Uh... Ring muscle up, she says, uh, the false grip said, my hands slip quite easily in false grip. That's why I'm having a bit of trouble. Yeah, def so, you can't. Are you using plastic Ooh. rings or, or yeah, wooden? Yeah, if you use That'll wooden rings and, uh, and get some chalk will help in terms of slippiness. And then I think the other thing is just, it comes then back to the, the more, the stronger you are in a good range of flexion at the wrist, um, the more, the, 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 the less that's going to slip out. But as Tim says, if you're using plastic rings and, you're, and your hands are a bit sweaty because you're training, then that will obviously cause that type as well. So a, a nice wooden ring uh, with a bit of chalk on uh, your fingers will help with that as well. The other thing is if it's a wrist mobility, mm -hmm. I think you mentioned before, if you can't get the top of your hand sort of flat, uh, sort of 90 degrees roughly mm -hmm. to the, where the forearm is, then you've probably got some tightness through the, your wrist extensors. So you might want to spend a bit of time doing some mobility work. Because if imagine it kind of imagine my elbow kind of in front of my body or my forearm vertical and then bringing my wrist down over. So I've got a tabletop mm -hmm. on the top of my wrist, on top of my back of my hand. If I'm at 90 degrees, I've got a really good position to get into a false grip. If I'm at like 45 degrees and I then go and try and hook a ring in it, it's only ever really going to slip off because I haven't got a good enough hook over the top. So that can yeah. be another thing. To oh, she's using, uh, I say, I don't know. Did it? Why did I say she? I don't know if it is she. Do I? I don't think they actually said. I don't know why I'm saying she. So. Um, apologies if it's a he. Um, so well round. Uh, she, uh, she, <laughs> just did it again. <laughs> They're using wooden rings. They're using wood rings. So yeah, I think. So it might be mobility yeah, or some would, chalk. Would, you'll, never, you'll never, you'll um, never, it's never, it's never going to be a problem in your false grip. You're like, oh, I've made my wrist now too flexible and my grip is too strong. Like, so if you work on the strength of the grip and the, and the range that you can create, as Tim just said, I think that'll be beneficial. Um, oh, saying this, got there, they have small hands. Yeah, the smaller, the smaller hand, it might be a bit of a problem, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not impossible. Promise you, promise you, promise you, it's not impossible. Um, right, uh, Marcelo, 
Um, hey guys, recently I've done calisthenics right, uh, and right now I can do seven or eight pull-ups but cannot do more than that. How can I begin doing more? We had this question actually on an Instagram Live with Coach Owen yesterday, a similar one about improving the number of repetitions of pull-ups when you're in around that like five, six, seven, eight area. Um, so Timbo, give us a, what, what would your fresh answer be on that rather? Because I thought I'd, I'd probably say the same thing as, as I did yesterday because there's a couple of different things you could do. So it's just a basically building, building, uh, pull yeah, be, wanting to be able to do more than six, than seven to eight pull-ups. They basically got to seven or eight and they've hit a plateau. Okay. So the, f the first thing in that, in that point I would go to, so you can do a pull-up, right? So you, you're getting some volume in there, which is pretty good. You've got some decent rep ranges. So my first question then is like, what, what's falling apart, which is stopping you from going further? So is it a strength issue in that you just need to build more capacity strength? You need some, some more pulling strength or is it a stability issue? So I'm going to start with stability issue. If you're losing the stabilization around the shoulder, so let's say, for example, to, to make this kind of applicable, if you go into a dead hang and you go into the active hang, which is the first movement in your pull-up, to do that requires quite a lot of activation from your mid-load traps, your rhomboids, to try and stabilize the shoulder to create a nice firm foundation from which you can pull on. Now, those muscles are often not as equally strong as the big pulling muscles like the lats so if that muscle starts to get tired after five or six reps and you now can't stabilize the shoulder and you can't get the shoulder blade set into mm. a strong active hang position then you haven't got a strong foundation to pull on so oftentimes when people are looking to scale pull-up reps i'm interested in scaling stability endurance or stabilization endurance so at that point i'll be thinking about doing some cable work some ytw work something which is going to help the improve the strength of the shoulder blade retractors effectively you, that could just be doing some more active hang type work if it's not that then it's a strength issue. So in that, in those circumstances, you can then start going down the route of doing more eccentrics. You could do some uh, isometric work to try and just bolster that kind of pulling strength tank that you've got. I'd also probably think about doing more horizontal pulling, even though it's not movement or pattern specific, mm -hmm. it's still muscle group relevant. So I would be thinking about just kind of finishing off some sessions with a bit more horizontal pull. But typically for most people, you should be doing some horizontal pull anyway if you're doing pull-ups because if you're not, you just, your shoulders are going to get smashed. You need to main, main, maintain that some balance in those positions. They're also good for scapular retraction. Um, but I would often be looking at yeah that stability issue. Are you losing the ability to create a firm foundation? And if you are, then I would go and target that. And if that's working okay, it doesn't look like that, I would then be thinking about doing some eccentric type work probably. I think you probably get more bang for your book if you're trying to scale volume from eccentrics and maybe you do some banded work just to go and train yourself to, to get a bit more experience or, or stimulus of doing 10 repetitions or 12 repetitions but you've got to be careful to make sure the intensity is actually sufficient with the right kind of band width to give you enough stimulus to make it sort of uh yeah. to cause yeah, adaptation sure. and yeah potentially it could be a bit of both of those two things um most people have got have got yeah. a weakness in their shoulder stabilizers. I'll, that's that's the case. So most people would benefit from doing more scapular um, stability. We have um, there's one uh, there's, there's a well rounded who has put all man. So sorry, <laughs> um, uh, has got a great final question. We're just going to say uh, that Matt has said. You know what they say about small hands? Yes, Matt. Small gloves. Um, well rounded. So, what was the most? I thought this is a nice final question to finish on. I think. Uh, what was the most difficult technique or drill you both had to master or practice the most? What was the most? Yeah, that's interesting. Good yeah. question. Good question. The most difficult one was probably when I first mm. learned to handstand. I had some success with it, but really getting it like nailed down nicely. It was the most difficult and probably the most frustrating. It took time um, to really kind of get control over the handstand. The, f the things like flags um, oh, yeah. they, and the back lever, like they come, once you've worked out what it is you need to do, you can, you can kind of push on with those and you, you get relatively good mm. return on your investment. There's a period in everybody's handstand training where you feel like you're getting yeah. nothing back from it. You don't feel like you're getting any better. And that's not a one week, two week thing. That could be a one month six week thing where you're kind of just like i don't know if i'm improving muscle up was frustrating when i mm. first learned to muscle up but 
I think I, that was a bit that took a bit of a but this straight yeah, bomb. I agree with you in what you said in terms of going like some of those strength things, it's a little bit once you develop the strength, you develop the strength. Whereas the skill part and I, I actually think I'd probably say that the uh like the tucked handstand when you're trying to do like a really nice like frog to handstand, pr- go when you get even if you've got the strength to press into that tuck position, just it's such a weird alien position. But now the fact that now once you get comfortable with it, it's actually you can that, that the tuck is easier to balance because everything's in closer than than a full handstand. But when you first try and do it, and and I see it all the time when we've um, when we're coaching people in workshops, um, which by the way we're excited will be uh, sounds like we'll be coming back later this year, so we're excited about that and starting to line some of those up. Um, but yeah, see see people, it's just it's just so different. It's just, it's just such a weird position. It, and it does, like you say, it, it does take you, you have that, all the frustrations of trying to, trying to balance on your hands. Um, so yeah, I'd probably say, I'd probably say that. To be honest, everything, everything when you can't do it is difficult and frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> and then as soon as you can do it, it's like, oh, it's all right. <laughs> so i am actually change my answer and say yeah. everything, everything that you, everything that you can't do. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. I'm interested to know what the argument in the, in the chat box was about. You have to tell me about that later. Um, thank you, everyone, though, for joining. Marcelo, uh, Colin Wong, and said, thank you, guys. Um, so appreciate everyone for tuning in and, and listening. This will be, if, you have jo- if you're literally joining it live now, as we're just about to sign off, this will go up um, as one of our podcast episodes. So if you don't, um, if you don't follow the podcast, listen to the podcast, it is available on all, it's on the website, scorecardsense.com, but it's also available on all of your podcast platforms like your iTunes, your Spotify, uh, wherever you listen to your um, podcast, it, it will be available there. Um, and there was something else I was going to say, but I think I've forgotten. Timbo. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you want any help with your training, we talked about structured training programs. And what we try to do with our virtual classroom is create a, somebody once described it back to us as mm. individualization for the masses. Um, because what we've done is put in our self-assessments. And I was actually, we do a free Q&A session webinar every Thursday night, myself and or Jacko. Well, we take it in turns, but you can come and ask your questions like live to us and, and we'll, we'll give you like, live feedback straight away there on the call. But what somebody said to me like, that's one of the best things about our virtual classroom is where you can go on there at the end of each section, say you're learning to do a muscle up or a handstand. At the end of each module of training programs, there'll be like a four week block and then there'll be a self-assessment and you can literally go through and we'll go, can you do X, Y, and Z, four or five different things. And if you can't, we give you the coaching cues mm-hmm. in it, but it helps people to, to understand when's the right time to progress. And if they can't do that thing, which is going to set them up for success in the next stage, what to do to go and correct it so that they can. So we really try and allow you to kind of take some of that control as an artist of your own, tra- own training program. And we, we go to a lot of effort to put education materials in there. We want you to understand why you're doing what you're doing. So when we talk about what resources, mm, if you want to yeah. learn about calisthenics, well, we, if you join our online training program, you get all the videos and a load of education. If you're on a VIP membership, I do webinars every month. You get some video analysis. There's so much in there. If you want to become a student of the game in a way which we always try and present information, which is going to be usable and digestible and, and not over your heads. Um, then I would recommend just come and check it out. You can get it free for seven days on any of our membership packages. Have a browse around, see if you agree with what we're saying. And if you do, yeah, then we would brilliant. Like to stay. And I've also remembered what I was going to say. It was if you don't subscribe yet on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe before this uh, finishes off. Well rounded. Yes, like and now we're very close, figures, so we? close we're to hundred thousand on, on YouTube. Like... Give us, show us some love. Get us, get us over that line. Uh, well. Yeah, I think yeah, you get something you, from YouTube if you I get to 100,000. I think they send you yeah, a golden post, car. Which we like um, it says, <laughs> well, well rounded. Ooh, uh, so thanks, guys. Great advice. Um, so, no, our pleasure. And uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you for, for, yeah, for being part of the Scorecard Senex. And uh, yeah, we are always here to help, as Tim said. And um, we look forward to helping you with your training and seeing that what progress that we all make together. Keep Until exploring next time. your physical potential through movement, strength, and play. Class dismissed. Uh, yeah. Is that stopped? I just have to manually.